In this week's episode, we're celebrating our 100th episode by answering some of your burning questions. You're listening to JFDI with the two Lauras. This is the podcast where we share tips, advice and inspiration for freelance social media managers so we can help you to build the business that you love. And as Laura has just said, in today's episode, we are celebrating that it's our 100th episode and we asked you guys to ask us questions. So we are going to crack straight on with answering your questions. I'm going to pass over to Laura. She's going to ask us the very first question. Let's do this. Okay, so this question was without a doubt the most popular question of all the questions we had. This is the one that was constantly repeated or variants of that. And essentially, what people want to know is, how do we get everything done? And how do we manage life with businesses and children, especially around school holidays, with a general theme? So the reason this podcast is called JFDI with the two laws is we have a very much a JFDI attitude, like we just have to get things done. And that's not just plucked out of thin air because we thought it was a nice name for a podcast. We it's very it's much actually a really rubbish name for a podcast. Yeah, if you're I honest. agree. There's no one searching for it. <laughs> no, it is. It's not good for SEO. Um, <laughs> but we digress. Um, it's very much the kind of mantra that we live by. Laura Moore, I'd say, way more than me. Like I may let's agree on something, then I'll write it down on my to-do list. I might think about it a bit. I might go make a cup of tea. By the time I've come back and made my cup of tea and sat back down, Laura Moore's already drafted something out. So I think we don't, we don't faff, do we? No. If it's a goer and we, we want to crack on with it, then we do just crack on with it because we work best under pressure. Is that fair? I would definitely say that's fair. And I think... And the reason that I am very much of like a, I've got to just do this thing is because if I don't start something, I never start it. But also if I don't start it and finish it really quickly, it never gets finished. So, and that's why my JFDI thing kind of comes into play. And I think that's why it looks like I do so much because I do it immediately. It's never kind of put on the back burner and anything that is put on the back burner with you and I never gets done, does it? We're like, yeah, we've obviously forgotten about it five minutes later. Yeah. So if we didn't have that JFDI attitude, we wouldn't get anything done, probably. And I think another reason, I guess, uh, and I don't want to speak to you for you, Laura, but I'm imagining this is going to be the same for you, is that because we're busy parents, which is kind of part of the question, you just don't know what the, the next week will bring. Like, if we mm. just look back over the last few months, in, well, less than that, like, probably two months, like, my son broke his foot. Then William broke his leg and now my son's broken his foot again. And so it's like you just don't know what's around the corner, do you, when you're a parent? No. And, and you can have weeks which are really, really busy or you suddenly have a child off sick. So it's like why put off today? What, no, why put off to, to, tomorrow what you can do today? Welcome what's to the- another episode of Laura Davis <laughs> not knowing a saying. <laughs> I'm, yeah anyway just you, jfdi is what you're trying to say <laughs> yeah just jfdi just get started give yourself a deadline if you're like us and work under pressure obviously some people don't work under pressure mm. and actually that's the worst thing for them but i suppose so therefore the overarching message is to lean into your strength lean into the best way that you work mm. and in regards to the specifics around how we cope with the school holidays I think we've always, and I talk about this just purely from the, our freelance life, like before we started working together, the only way I could ever get summer holidays to work was to be really organised and planning in advance. And Laura and I are not planners. I no. have, like, like it, if someone was said to me now, oh, I've got to start thinking about the school holidays, like the summer holidays, I'd be like, what? You're going to laugh. But when it gets to about six weeks out, so, you know, start of June, I do have to start thinking, right, what is coming up over the summer? I hound my clients now, like I still do this now. Like, What is going to be happening over the summer? So I can at least make a start on getting content ready, scheduled, created, whatever it is that needs to be done. I can think about what ad campaigns I'm getting done. And if necessary, I'll build my ad campaigns and have them in draft pre-summer holidays. And within our business, I think it's very much the same. Like we look at like, what do we want to do next? Because that's how we work. We don't look at what do we want to do in the next year? It's like, right, what's our priority next? 
And then we say, right, well, we've got a school holiday coming up, you know, and typically our school holidays never bloody align. <laughs> no. So it's often like the Easter holidays, for example, is like three weeks for us. And then we work around that. And mm. we just accept that school holidays are going to be difficult. And in school holidays, that's generally when we do the work that we want to do mm -hmm. rather than we have to do. We try yeah. to get the work that we have to do done before the school holiday. So then when we're in the holidays and if we get child free time or on an evening or we, whenever we want to work and can work, we can, we can just do what the things that we want to do as opposed to any pressure on ourselves. Yeah. I think there is something else that we do do in our business that I think more people should do. And it's the thing that helps us to get so much done is that our business is basically one massive template. Like everything <laughs> is templated in our business, isn't it? We've got templates like for working with clients, we've got proposal templates, order templates, all of that stuff. But in our business together, we've got templates for like sales pages, for lead magnet pages. All of those things are just templated. You know, even like down to like the copy for a, for a sales page, everything is a template. Our Instagram content, it's all a template. And it just makes everything much quicker. So you're not starting from scratch every time. And I just think people spend so much time when they start from scratch. and It's much harder to get going, let alone get finished if you're doing that every time. Yeah. And I think we like we automate quite a lot. There's a lot of things. Oh, yeah. And I'm not going to pretend that I know half of it because it's Laura Moore's area of expertise. But a lot of things is, are, are automated to make our lives easier and Carrie's life easier. Yeah. So if you can automate things, then definitely do it. But organisation. Yeah. And if you're thinking like, what can I automate in my life or in my business? Anything that you do exactly the same way more than once, like on a regular basis, even if it's like just monthly, especially if it, you know, it's in like a tool that does can do things automatically or if it integrates with Zapier, see if you can automate it. Like automate sending your invoices, for example, all of those things, pulling your reports off of tools like Agora Pulse, all of that can happen automatically. You don't have to yeah. go in and, you know, grab all that data yourself. There's a lot of things that can be automated. Yeah. And I think you have to let go of the control freak. Yes. Yeah. You know, sometimes, because yeah. sometimes it can be done better automated. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so don't feel like you've got to be doing everything and crossing every T and dotting every I. I nearly got that phrase wrong as well then. <laughs> okay, so I think that generally, that's us. That's how we are. Not everybody's the same. We're, we are just winging it. We, you know, we don't always get it right. There are summer holidays that sometimes, or all holidays, that sometimes shit happens and we have to deal with it. We are very normal. <laughs> Yeah, we are not floating through life thinking, you know, we've nailed this. There's always things we can do better. There's always better ways that we can work. There's always new tools and things that can help us. And despite lots of people always saying to us, oh, my God, you get so much done. Oh, how do you get so much done? And that is a question that we have all the time. Like there is two of us to start with. Mm -hmm. And we're not as quick necessarily as I think people think because you don't see everything, do you? Yeah, you just see things. People see things when we can maybe start promoting them, or we might share things in the membership, etc. But they could have been things that we've been working on for quite a long time. So, yeah, don't believe everything. People don't see the mistakes that happen behind the scenes, and they probably think that everything that we do like runs smoothly. Trust me, it does not. No, just this week alone, I accidentally sent an email on the wrong day. You know, <laughs> things go wrong all the time. It's just that you just probably don't notice them. I deleted a load of it, uh, ad campaigns last week for us. That was another. Yeah. That was another fuck up. Like we are <laughs> like normal, and things don't always go our way. And we we would be um we aren't bullshit type people, and we would be silly if we sat here saying life is a bloody dream, and off we go on no. our yacht for the summer holidays. Oh. Can you get a wheelchair accessible yacht? I don't know about that. Probably not. I don't know, but if there's a gap in the market, I'm game if you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next question is an audio question from Emily. Hey, Laura's. So I'm Emily. I'm from the Business Widget. What would you say in your experience of running the membership for all this time has been the number one or like the number three or the five maybe, depends how many you can think of, mistakes that social media managers make 
that could be at the start of their businesses or just throughout, you know, I would imagine from I've been in the membership now since 2020. And there's always lots of reoccurring sort of themes of questions. But yeah, what would you say are the biggest mistakes that lots of social media managers make? Thank you. Okay, I think this is a brilliant question, by the way. Same. So and let's do three mistakes because I, I can think of three. And the first one that I want to kind of raise is one that we harp on about all the time. I mean, we've probably mentioned this in probably nine out of 10 podcasts, but <laughs> so many social media managers we see who are struggling to find clients, it comes back to the fact that they're either not marketing their own business or they're only marketing their business when they need clients. And I think it's a massive mistake, A, not to market your business because you know so many people will actually come and look on your account to see if you you know if you can do what you say you're going to do before they hire you but also like you know how important marketing is if you work in this kind of arena so it's important that you do it but it's also important to do it even when you're at capacity and it's actually probably more important to do it when you're at capacity because when you are at capacity even if you don't need clients you can be building a wait list you can be you know when you are in demand that's when you can put your fees up that's when you can get rid of the rubbish clients you don't like working with and replace them with even better people so Like that is a massive mistake is not marketing your business, I think. You're going to say the same. Yeah, and only waiting for when you suddenly need a client. And it was interesting. We had a call with someone yesterday or a few people yesterday and someone made a really good point, which is so true in that if you're struggling for kind of inbound inquiries now, it's as a result of what you didn't do three months ago. So yeah, and it's, it's so true. You know, yes, especially things like social media marketing, it's not always going to be a quick win. So you need to be doing things now that will be helpful kind of going forward. It's not a quick fix. Mm. So just kind of as soon as you get a couple of clients when you're at capacity and you stop marketing your business, you'll suffer the consequences of that in the future. And I think lots of people, when they say they're at capacity, they should be building a business where their capacity allows for them time to be marketing their business. So when they sit down and think, right, well, I work five days a week, I'm going to make sure my capacity for client work is four days a week because I want to allow one day a week to work on my business, for example. And capacity in your business should not be you working 100% for other people's businesses. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Good point. Well made, Davis. Thanks, (laughs) Maul. Okay, so on probably my mistake... (laughs) which is probably actually very similar. We probably could have combined them, but let's just roll with it. Is that people rely on their social media as a form of marketing Mm -hmm. because, and I get it, we're social media marketers. Like that should be in theory, our strongest form of marketing. And you would want that to be, you would want that to be the case in our world because we know businesses come and check out your social media before they hire you. So with that's a a definite, we've done the research on that. What is it? Ninety. 97- 97. Off the top of my head, I want to say 97%, but yeah, I'd have to I check. Think, I think it is. 97% of businesses will come and check out your social media before they hire you. So we know that, but that's not to say that that's the only thing you should be doing. And we're very passionate about the fact that you should be building an email list as well and not just relying on social. And we won't harp on about that because we've harped on about that a lot in other episodes. So go have a listen to those. But it could be that you really like networking. It could be like you're an ads manager and you want to do ads as a form of marketing, whatever it is. But I just try not to rely solely on social media. But I think the biggest thing, and I I speak for myself, this is a big mistake that I think I made when I was a freelancer is I didn't grow my email list. And I do think that should be more important to people. Yeah, I would agree. Definitely. Okay. So this was more about mindset and imposter syndrome and the reason we see this happening again and again and again is because social media managers seem to follow thousands of other social media managers on social and we've said this before like don't follow other social media managers and people get a bit like offended by it like but they're my friends and it's like that's fine like if you're genuinely friends with these people then obviously there's nothing there's no harm in following them if you're just following other social media managers who you don't know from Adam and you like follow them because you think they're nailing it, that is your fastest way to have like imposter syndrome. 
because people always think other people are doing better despite the fact you might have different audiences you might have different capacity you might have different business goals you might have different kind of offers people forget all that and just look at the face value and say oh well that person's had a reel that's got five million views therefore they're nailing it Mm. and we all know that that means jack shit and it's vanity metrics but honestly I think the biggest mistake lots of social media managers make to affect their mindset is by following other people who have a negative impact on them and like we, we we connect with people on social because we kind of feel like it's polite maybe to do so but then we'll just mute them (laughs) We'll yeah. mute them, we'll block them because we don't want it to change our mindset. We don't want it to impact us. We don't want us to get like swayed. Oh God, they're saying this. Maybe we shouldn't say that. Mm. I think there's a time and a place to be. I think like you need a circle where you are in a community or, you know, in some sort of network with people who do the same job as you. That's what we've got the inner hub for, for example. And I think that's where you connect and you communicate with the people because everyone's more honest in a private, you know, conversation that everyone's more honest and more open to helping each other. The content in there is for you because, you know, people are asking a question about their business. That's for you rather than the content they're putting out on their socials is for their audience. It's not for you. So no matter what they're saying, you know, if all these people who are on Instagram, for example, saying about you should only use five ha- five hashtags. If you're only following social media managers who are saying that, then immediately you think, oh my God, I should only use five hashtags. Whereas if you're in a community and someone's like, should I only be using five hashtags? There's a much more honest and open conversation about that. You're going to get people's real opinions rather than people just going, yes, this is definitely true. Do you know what I mean? I feel like you just need to think about where you're communicating with people and what message they're putting out into the public and would that be the same conversation they would have in private? And also, I think when you end up following loads of social media managers, or if you're an ads manager, loads of ads managers, you end up in this weird world where you start creating content for them rather than for your audience. Like the messaging is at the level yeah. that those social media managers understand rather than your clients. And you you get lost then because it's either too advanced or yeah. you know, it's not right for your audience. Yeah, no, that is a good point. And I see that a lot where you people end up thinking, well, this social media or ads manager has just said this. So I need to say something a bit more complex, a bit more yeah. clever, because it's going to make me sound better than everybody else. But actually, yeah. your audience, who is not ads managers and social media managers, are going, I don't even know what you're talking about. This is beyond me. This isn't right for me because my business, I can't understand that. Yeah. So that's a really good point. And I think yeah. just kind of going back to what I said earlier, if you're friends with people and like what Laura is saying, if you've got a circle of people around you in a community, then it's all very well. You can see, oh, amazing, that reel did really well or that LinkedIn post did great. But in your DMs, they're saying, yeah, it did great, but I've got no inquiries or I've got no traffic to your website. So you, you kind of can hear both sides of the story when you're friends with people and, and that's fine because you want that you need that context you shouldn't just be taking everything at face value yeah and just before we move on can I just say you shouldn't be just using five hashtags (laughs) mic drop there from Laura Davis (laughs) (laughs) okay next question was from uh, Jenny on I think this one I think was on Instagram not that that matters she wants to know what our absolute non-negotiables are in managing our business which I thought was quite a good question. Yeah, I think there's probably a few. I yeah. think the first one that springs to mind that is non-negotiable for us is that we have to agree on everything before we do anything. Yeah. We never do anything where we both, where one of us is like, no, we're definitely going to do this. And the other one is like, no, we're definitely not. Yeah, no, we have to agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Another non-negotiable, actually, that's just sprung to mind that we talk about on the podcast quite a lot people who know us will know this non-negotiable we don't do speaking gigs Uh no you're not getting us on a stage talking about anything no no way you know depends how much you might bribe us with but no we're not doing it (laughs) (laughs) like a small stage of maybe five people although that feels worse than a big stage to me that's more like a step than a stage (laughs) (laughs) i could stand on my soapbox that'd be fine 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the, I suppose, and it's very much linked with that, is a non-negotiable for, from my perspective is that we should never feel guilty about saying no to something. And yeah. that's taken quite a lot of learning. You oh, know, yeah. it's like we, we get asked to speak quite a lot and we just, and we used to say yes. And then, and then like, have to say no. <laughs> and then had to find our way out of it. <laughs> yeah. and, until we realised that it's, that is just not what we want to do. It's not our zone of genius. It's not where we enjoy spending our time. And back to the previous question in regards to managing our work and managing around our kids, like flying all around doing speaking gigs, flying or getting the train, driving, <laughs> whatever form, walking, it's just hard. Like, it's really hard for us. Yeah. Even if we wanted to speak, like, the practicalities of life. Like, we are both self-employed, so we can do the things we want to do with our family and be there for our family when they need us. And so me then suddenly go, right, I'm off, I've got a speaking gig and another, another speaking gig, and yeah. it just doesn't work. See you later, go to Vegas. Yeah. It's oh, not going to go I'd... down well. Yeah, but maybe we should pretend that one and then just go oh, on a that holiday. That would be a good one to pretend. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I think, but overall, it's not just about speaking. It's like we say no a lot. Like we mm. don't do a lot. <laughs> we say no to brands who contact us wanting us to do stuff with them or do social content for them. We just say no to it because it's just not what we want. It's not. Yeah. But there could be people listening to us going, oh my God, you're like turning away money. But it's like, it's just not what, we're just not interested in that. It's just, you know, there are some t opportunities that we do take advantage of, but we never say no and feel guilty now. But it's, And no. I, I definitely think that is something that I'd recommend other people trying to do because we can't be all to everybody. And the reason why we can do what we do and get so much done is because we've said no to lots of things and not felt guilty about it. And then we've just cracked on with the things that we are more of a priority for us. So, yeah, um, yeah no guilt is that yeah, one. Yeah, that's a good one. Any more? Yeah, another one, which we've always been like this, is our non-negotiable has to, is, is that everything we create, everything that we produce has to be amazing. It cannot be shit. Yeah, that was kind of our one-line business plan, wasn't it, when we first yeah. got together? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, let's not write a business plan. Let's just decide that everything has to be really amazing. Yeah. And I'm sure, like, I'm sure most people don't go into their business thinking, I'm just going to create a load of crap. But, like, we are really picky. We will put stuff together and Joe Public will probably look at it and think, oh, this is really good. And we'll be like, no, it's not good enough yet. It's not good enough yet. It's got to be way yeah. better than that. Or we and put things out there and then we go this could be better and we give it a yeah. overhaul within like a week yeah. or like we see something someone might say and we'll go, we need to get this better. We need to change that. That People shouldn't be asking that question after they've had that. Let's make it better. Yeah. Like we are constantly striving for things to be the absolute best. And sometimes we have to put things out there to get a response to enable us to, to determine whether yeah. it's good enough or not. You know, we never sit still, do we, in that everything, if we're not creating something new, we're reviewing everything we've got and constantly thinking, how can we make this better? How can we make this more implement implementable? How can we make this easier to consume? We're constantly doing that. Like, it's quite tiring, to be fair. <laughs> to be yeah. fair. I know, quite often I'll be, like, doing something and my husband's like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just making the toolkit better. And he'll be like, all right, is it going to make you money? No. <laughs> people already got the toolkit i'm just making it better for them and he's like okay then yeah but, but yeah. that's you know in the long term you will we hope that that will make because hopefully more people will kind of recommend it and you know which lots of people do already and yeah so it, it is a good thing yeah definitely or you know you could just say it's a way of avoiding talking to your husband or watching shit tv with your husband well, i but... mean that probably is actually why i'm doing it let's be real <laughs> Okay, the other non-negotiable, I think, is that we don't subscribe to bullshit. And I think that's yes. in, in how we deliver and how we receive. So in terms of like how we receive, there's so much bullshit out there. And I think, and I think you're quite good at it, but I think I'm better than you. Oh, in that I, I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> I've got good bullshit radars. Yeah, you are a much better judge of character than I am. I trust yeah. people until I don't have a reason to, whereas you don't trust people until they give you a reason to. Yeah, and I will never change that. 
Mm. And I, you know, I have got things wrong in the past. And although I've not listened to my gut and I've been led down a path and then I've thought, what the fuck am I Mm. doing? Like, but I'm much better at that now. But so I don't subscribe to bullshit in that I don't listen to it. If if I see something and it even kind of makes me think, is this bullshit or is it not? I will go away and I will dig deeper. I will read more. I will go and ask people's opinions, uh, you know, whatever it may be, because this goes across the board, whether it's someone's shitty, you know, claims on a website or whether it's someone's personal opinion about something I will always question it and like and sometimes you're like god you know you've got to trust (laughs) you don't trust anyone (laughs) and like because I can probably in that vein maybe come across a little bit negative a bit paranoid yeah yeah but I much prefer to be that it's like my defense mechanism Mm. like I'd much rather get someone wrong than trust someone and then be let down because that has happened and I don't want I don't want to be in those situations again and there is so much bullshit in the marketing online space it is quite incredible honestly if we wrote a book it would be too heavy to carry (laughs) we'd never finish writing the book to be honest we probably would never get started on writing the book so let's not even go down that road (laughs) (laughs) well yeah Uh, so I think so we don't subscribe to bullshit and we question everything and we try to have our we're very very careful about who we listen to but also who we would then kind of introduce to our friends our you know our our community you know bring their opinions into other people I think we're very like yeah yeah, wary of that kind of thing because we like I've been associated with people in the past and it's ruined like my reputation, just by being associated with them. So we're quite careful about that now. Yeah, we've definitely learned the hard way. And it's hard, you know, because we don't necessarily want to enforce our opinions on other people. And so sometimes people will post in the inner hub, for example, in the membership and say, I've just read this about, and this person has said this, or this person's recommended we do this. And it's someone who's on our radar as being a bullshitter. And we it's very difficult because for me, my... Enneagram 8 response is don't listen to that idiot Mm. (laughs) but like that's harsh and I don't want to get sued so it's hard it's hard for us because we're Enneagram 8s to not be outspoken about that but equally I do very much think there's different people for everybody isn't there like we're very aligned on who we don't like (laughs) and who we (laughs) who we think is bullshitting and and that's a good thing that we obviously aligned in that. But that doesn't mean that another person would think differently. And that's okay. Mm. Just because our opinion is one way doesn't mean everybody. So we don't sit there saying, you cannot speak to these people because they're all a crock of shit. Because that's not for us to do that. But I my, I suppose the lesson from other people's perspective is that you should have that. Like, have think about your spider senses in terms of, are they a bullshitter? Question everything. Don't t- take things on face value are people actually recommending it or are they trying to get affiliate kickbacks, for example? Mm -hmm. You know, so just question everything. Be more Laura Davis than than Laura Moore when it comes to uh, judging people. (laughs) Yeah, don't just trust everyone (laughs) until they do you over. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I I guess on the bullshit that we don't subscribe to bullshit is that we also don't deliver on bullshit. So we don't, you know... We've had people say to us, oh, you know, you need to be saying that the toolkit's going to make you seven figures or six figures or that. And like you'll notice it doesn't because we don't say that. It can do. And it does. Like there's lots of people who've got the toolkit who do make six figures. A lot of money. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so we could make that claim because we know that it has happened for some people. But we are very much and we've talked about this before. We success to us is not and to a lot of people it's not about the money in the bank Mm. so we just don't we don't believe it in that we don't want to kind of bullshit people and actually if there's somebody who's only got two days a week between nine and three to work on their business and they've got a lot going on in their lives and they don't want the pressure they just want a couple of easy like smallish clients like we don't want them to feel like that 
therefore the the tools they're given aren't working because mm. they've not got six figures. We want yeah. the tools to work because it's helping them to get what they want at that point in their time. And if in you know three years' time they are ready to kind of scale it, they we hope they still because they've already subscribed to everything, bought the toolkit, what have you can achieve whatever they want to achieve when it's right for them to achieve it because we're all so different we all have so different like constraints in our lives as to what we can achieve or want to achieve on the other the other kind of flip side of that or maybe it's the same side I don't know but if you're looking at all of these (laughs) other like sales page type websites and they're like oh you know I can help you to make 20 grand months and blah 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 and they show you a testimonial of somebody who's made 20 grand I might show you another testimonial of someone who's made six grand and all of this stuff. And there might be, let's say there's 10 testimonials on there. They've all got different amounts of of numbers on there. This is where your bullshit radar needs to come on because have they done that one month or are they doing it every month? And what about all of the other people who they don't have the testimonials for? How much money are they making? You know, so I feel like it's, it's just a wild claim to always lead with that. And I feel like the people who lead with that on their sales pages lead with it because that's all they can say. They can't say, you know, it's helped so-and-so to retire their husband or it's helped blah, 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 to be able to go and like, you know, do the school run every day because those don't feel like such aspirational things that people want to do. But that is real life. And, you know, it's the real life things that people want to do. And this is a di- like we were, we were talking about this yesterday as well, you know, that, you know, yes, you could put on a sales page, oh, well, people in the talk of are all like, you buy the toolkit and you're going to make I'm just using the talk toolkit as an example buy the toolkit and you can make like six figures you could put that but what I know what's more important to not all but probably about I know 60 70 percent of our members or our customers it is about being on the school run it is about being at home caring for a child it is about having time to care for an elderly parent so if we were to put those kind of things on the sales page Although it means something, because so many people now are going out there with such wild like claims, it kind of makes all those things feel a bit, ugh, that's not very aspirational. But the reality is that is aspirational. Well, that's exactly why I started, you know, being self-employed was because I've got a disabled child. I need to be able to work around him. I need to be able to work anywhere. It's not about like, yes, obviously I need money to pay the bills, but the whole reason that I don't have a job and I have my own business is because I would need to work around William. So, you know, it comes back to the why, doesn't it, of why do people want to have their business? And I don't think anyone's, well, maybe some people, but I don't think most people start their own businesses with that mindset of I'm starting a business because I want to be a millionaire. Or maybe if you're in like Only Fools and Horses. But, you know, they, they start the business because they want it to, to like, what does, what does being a millionaire mean? I think we're going on a right tangent here, by the way. <laughs> no, I know. But I do, but unfortunately, I do think people, some people do start their business because they see these like sales pages. Oh, yeah, they see the these, the bullshit and the claims. And they think, oh, you know what? Why am I sat here on a 30 grand a year job with annual leave mm-hmm. and sick pay? I'm going to go and do that because I can make £100,000 and sit on my yacht. Like it, And then they realise it doesn't. I feel like we're just very British. Don't you feel like we're just very British? We just don't talk about that that sort of the money side because it's like, I don't know about you, but I've been raised, you don't talk about money at the dinner table and all of that crap. And it feels like icky still to talk about that stuff because that isn't what everyone does want to achieve. And yes, the money pays for you to be able to do the things you want to do, but the things that people want to do are all different. Yeah, kind of. And maybe, and we are obviously terribly British, but like I don't. Oh have yes, a pass me my scone and my cup of tea. <laughs> I don't have a problem with talking about money. Like I don't find it icky, but I do have a problem talking about money and people thinking that their path will be the same as my path. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, what kind if of I if if I was to say to them, oh well, my last month when I was a hundred percent freelance before we started, my income was whatever it was. And I'm not saying it because I genuinely don't know what it was. I'm not just trying to be elusive with it. But, uh, you know, what's more important is probably for the first year, I was probably making no more than, I don't know, £350 a month. (laughs) But I only had one day a week with three children under the age of six. 
and one day a week and that day was a tiny day and the rest mm. of that I would just have the occasional nap times or work a little bit in the evening and we've spoken as well about the months where you made the most amount of money being the worst months of your lives you know well, yeah <laughs> so yeah you know. the year I did the best was the worst year without doubt and that's mm. for other people that is what I would what I was earning would be quite aspirational and they want that but they wouldn't mm. they don't potentially have three kids who have to be in three different places at the same time and have lots of different needs and demands on my time and I was miserable I was really really miserable and so the first thing I did after I paid for that bloody holiday to Lapland, and that was the only reason why, is because I said, I'm going to pay for a holiday and I'm going to make it a best holiday. So I paid for Lapland, like completely out of my own pocket, told my husband, I don't want any help from you. I'm going to do it all on my set <laughs> and, you know. And I regretted it because then I had to earn so much money to just do pay for the normal bills, mortgage, everything else, and that. And as soon as that was paid, I was like, right, I am getting rid of some of these clients. And I just completely culled a lot of them. Mm. And then it was amazing. Like, it was such a nice job. You know, I was forever in the coffee shop. I was, I just had a good life. And then you came into my world and everything changed again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I ruined your life. <laughs> yeah, I'm never in a coffee shop now. <laughs> okay. So anyway, yeah, we have gone a bit of a tangent because we're, we're like waffling away so we've got one more question okay which is a question from biz paul hi lauras it's biz paul here i just wanted to know how you resolve conflicts between each other what is the worst thing you've fallen out over and how did you resolve it oh i love this question right can i just tell you that there was one time when i did <laughs> slam my laptop shut on a zoom call with laura davis <laughs> i can't remember what yeah. it's about though no, I can't. I have been trying to think about that. I think it was just you were adamant we needed to do something one way and I was adamant we needed to do it another way. And obviously you were just having a bad day. And we probably we, never did the thing, <laughs> whatever the thing was. We do, well, like we've talked about with one of our non-negotiables is that we have to both agree on everything. And if you look in our, if we had a real life bin of ideas, it would be overflowing. Oh my God, because, it'd be a skip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we both don't agree on a lot of things. And sometimes we come back to them and then we look at it in a different way and or the other person changes their mind. And I feel like sometimes Laura Davis, I disagree with her on something and she'll somehow, and I don't know how you do this, it's like you hypnotise me for me to then come up with it as my idea and then you'll be like, yeah, I said that a few weeks ago. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then it's yeah. like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true it's just a magic skill of mine um <laughs> so yes there was one time when Laura slammed a laptop down but I think you were just having a bad day because we do we don't argue at all no. really do we yes we do we dis yes we do <laughs> <laughs> we do disagree a lot but then I think that's mm. fine and I think so it's quite a boring I think answer to Paul's question like there's been no major dramas we've not had any major fallouts even that time when you slammed your laptop Shut. I think you just had a cup of tea and then it was like an hour later we were back on Zoom and I don't think we yeah. kind of really talked about it we just kind of moved on but I think it helps that there are some of the things that helps is that Laura and I are very similar and like we've kind of touched mm -hmm. on we've got very similar values similar but different kind of demands on our life in terms of we're busy parents and obviously for different kind of reasons but we and we respect the, that for both of us We've got very similar personalities. We're both Enneagram 8s, which in theory shouldn't work. Well, I kind of feel like it does because Enneagram 8, yes, we're like boisterous and feisty, but we don't like conflict. Yeah. So, it's, that's, so that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Because there's lots of times where Laura will be like arguing her case and I just go, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, I can't be asked to argue with this one. Yeah, ditto. And it's because I don't feel strongly enough the other way. Yeah. So I yeah. just think, let's just go with it. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't think we've ever fucked up as a result of that. No. And so actually very rarely do we put our foot down and say, no, I don't agree with this. Mm. And I think it's also what goes in our favour is that we both consume information, life in diff very different ways. 
And I think yeah. that's a good thing in that when we're thinking about how we deliver something, Laura might be, oh, yeah, but we have to do it this way because that's what I think is the best way because that's how she would mm. consume content, for example. Whereas I would be, well, no, but I don't, I don't do that. Like, I don't mm. consume it that way. Or, you know, it's like I, do, I hate, I hate email marketing. I hate emails in my inbox. So, <laughs> like, we've always been – our emails have to be good enough that I'm not embarrassed to be in someone's inbox. You know, they have yeah. to be. And Laura's brilliant at writing emails, so that's a good thing because, like, if, if it was me, we just wouldn't send any because I don't like email. And I think the fact that we kind of, we are the same but different <laughs> really helps. I think it kind of complements each other. So we don't have major, we don't have major issues. no. We're probably going to have a massive argument after this. And I, I will know. blame Paul for it. Yeah, Paul, it will all be your fault. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite a boring answer to your question. I think we just, we're very open, we're very honest. I feel like sometimes we just, we, we pick our battles. If, if we feel strongly enough about something, we will argue it, you know, argue our case. If we don't, we just do what the other one said. Yeah. It's a bit like parenting teenagers, isn't it? you yeah. just got to choose your battles, know when to... Yeah keep your mouth shut, know when it's important to just kind of step in and say, no, this is shit, or no, we need to do this differently, or no, we don't yeah. need to do this at all, or, you know. Yeah. So, sorry, that that's quite boring. <laughs> there we go. No major drama, no big fallouts, no one's punched yeah. anyone. Or well, virtual punch. I don't, don't think that would be very easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe it helps that we're on the other side of the country. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, there we go then. Yeah, that is our 100th episode. I can't believe we've had 100 episodes. That is crazy. Yeah, but if we didn't have that six-month little Christmas holiday off... Oh, yeah, we'd be on about 500 we'd, now. We'd be way more than that. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for listening. The podcast is something that we have worked very hard on over the 100th episodes. We're very lucky that we're often in, like, top 20 of the kind of UK marketing charts most weeks which is like amazing and we seem to be doing well in like Australia and New Zealand as well at the moment so if you're listening from Dalander that was my Australian accent um (laughs) thank you and just generally thank you and if you like the podcast we don't ask this enough we would love it if you could go and give us a little review over on whichever podcast player you listen on we really do love it when we get them it means a lot to us we are as we have discussed very normal people and any normal person likes to be given a little bit of a lift if somebody likes it and it's still quite wild to us that people actually listen to our podcast if we're honest yeah well if i think about that too much though i wouldn't record them so i just pretend that no one listens no this is true this is true yeah okay yeah no one's listening thank you for not listening (laughs) Oh, God, isn't that something that Stephen Bartlett says? Let's not say that. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) Right, so that's it. We will be back as normal next week uh, for our 101... 101. 101. 101. Episode number 101. (laughs) I'll work out how to say things, haven't I? Yeah, you really do. I'll try and do that by our 200. If you did, we might be... 10 more often not just top 20 yeah this is true I'll work on it by the 200th I'll have nailed every little cliche and metaphor and saying (laughs) alright see you next week au revoir au revoir